Well, I have the pleasure. I have the pleasure of having Mr. Andrew Gold, Señor Gold. ¿Cómo está? Muy bien, muy bien. ¿Y vos? Ay, qué bonito. I love it. You speak Spanish? Where did you learn oh, yeah. Spanish? Are you learning Spanish? I speak five languages. I'm a linguist. That's what that's what I was sort of going that's what I would be doing, I suppose, linguist. And some people say that's not a linguist. A linguist is someone who studies linguistics, but if you look on the definition of uh, a linguist or linguistic, uh, it, it does say or speaks many languages. Um, I lived in Argentina for six years, Colombia for one Colombia. year, and uh, Medellin. That was a trip living in Colombia. <laughs> oh yeah, Medellin, uh, that was great. Uh, but then Germany a few years and uh, France for a few years and some time in Brazil. And I love all the languages. So that's what it's all oh, about. You lived in Brazil? Well, only a couple of months in Brazil. That was the one. Oh, okay. That's my Do weakest you... language, Portuguese. Oh, okay. But you don't speak Argentinian. You speak Spanish. But, well, <laughs> bueno, hablo con un acento medio argentino, ¿no? Sí, sí, no sí. Sé. Pero es por, es because Megan Markle says she speaks Argentinian, although... Oh, you for know, God's sake. Spanish. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> what an idiot that woman is. <laughs> so, I, I, please, Andrew, you know that um, we're here to talk about your book and we're going to talk about it, everything because I have so many questions about Scientology too but mm. uh, for people to come and see about your book can you please give a little bit of uh, introduction about your book Sure. And we've got to give people some talk about the royals, really, don't we? We've got to do some Megan bashing because yeah, yeah, yeah. otherwise. Later, later, but of course we will. Don't worry, because actually, you know, the psychology of secrets, that's very much in, in her realm, I think. You know? I think so as well. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, that's my book, The Psychology of Secrets. I love that they got it, this purple, very kitsch uh, book cover because they were just saying, look, most covers are white or black or whatever. And we want yours to stand out because it is a different kind of book. And you know what's been really nice is most of the reviews. Now, firstly, like I think on Amazon where you've got that page up, 72 out of 75, there are five stars, which is really nice of people. And it helps a lot. So thank you guys for doing that. But I think what a lot of people are saying is they expected this because it's called The Psychology of Secrets to be quite heavy. And although it has a lot of that stuff about what it's like to keep a secret, how many we all keep and how many what, what happens to us when we keep too many and how you can get secrets from people. It's it's mostly fun, interesting, true crime kinds of stories about weird and strange people that I've met who are keeping secrets and what it's been like for them to keep those secrets. So people have been really entertained by it, which when I do anything from YouTube to books, that is the primary goal. So I hope people do. And by the way, if anyone goes out and gets it, please say that you got it from watching this because I like knowing uh, where people got it and things okay, like that. Okay, yeah, in, just in the tell them where, where you heard it from. I, of course, I will leave the link of the book so you guys can go run and buy it. And also what, 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 the link to your channel, of course, on YouTube, which I love, by the way, I watch it oh, all the time. Um, so because, you know, that that's amazing. I love it. I love it. So this is basically a book about a bunch of weirdos that hold secrets, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, well, I suppose so. I mean, mostly, yeah, weird, weird people. I mean, some of the things I mean, it took years and years to find people sufficiently weird um, or su with sufficiently interesting stories. So, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, Churchill. Churchill's wartime minister did a very strange thing back in the 60s where, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to spoil it too much, but yeah. he basically, he started a school in Scotland and he attended the school himself and convinced all the other children that he was like 15, but he was 53. Um, so that was a secret he was keeping. Those kinds of things. There were some mad, mad secrets that I managed to find and really go into and try and understand why these people did such strange things. Oh, my God. Did you find any secrets about any royals uh, in the past or whatever? Not too much. I mean, I, I spoke up. There's, there's, there are passages where I talked about uh, Megan and uh, just the fact that this is now an institution, the royal family, that has basically built itself on having secrets and it can no longer really keep them in today's world. And that's a challenge for the royal family. Listen, I love the royals. Um, I sometimes criticize some things that they do as well, uh, but it's a really difficult time for them to be able to keep any kinds of secrets now. Everything just gets out. And if you don't have any secrets, secrets give you mystique and make people want to watch you more. And if you don't have them, I think people will stop paying attention. So they need to be able to keep as many secrets as possible and stop Meghan and Harry getting all of their secrets out into the open. I mean, that example of Mystique, 
when Harry describes Charles, for example, as um, you know, in his underwear uh, against you know against the door and things like that, it's like you know, a hundred years ago, the royals had this this amazing. They were almost uh, godly. Even Queen Elizabeth II, she didn't feel like a real person because she was so brilliant at her job. And and I think that's what you need in a in a monarch is somebody who we could all reflect our own beliefs and thoughts and hopes into. She was so yeah. wonderful at yeah. just being almost a blank slate. That's that's not as easy as it seems while also carrying out duties. So everybody was like, oh, she's so hysterical. She's so funny. Well, it's only people who really valued humor who were saying that. Uh, and, and was she that funny? I, I don't know. She made a few little jokes and sure. things. Or uh, Other people said, wow, so courageous. So this, we were able to project all of the things, the wishes and desires we had for the nation onto her because she was so wonderful at her job. And That's now cool. we've got King Charles in his underwear in our imaginations. And that is thanks to Harry and Meghan and their pursuit of Hollywood. But Jane, I wonder if it's a difference be because I find that Harry, okay, he didn't say many secrets. I think I find that he lied about a lot of stuff, but it's just I think that in his book he tried to demean Charles, like you said, by portraying him in his underwear, because we all know we all wear underwear, you know. But the way he does, I mean, at least I am right now. Um, yes. So, but um, but the way that, that the fact that he portrays him like that, it was in a demeaning manner. So there's a big difference between privacy, modesty and secrecy, which I find that Harry and Meghan, especially Meghan, uh, they need the cloak of secrecy to carry out all this stuff. But not only them, you know, like I follow you a lot on Scientology, you know, like and, and the cult and, and everything like that. And I wanted to ask you, because um, I, do you find across the spectrum and even in different um, societies, royal family, Scientology, celebrities, regular people, do you find that there are certain characteristic of, uh, of people, when you see people in a cult, you say, oh, these are very, you know, same char characteristics across the board, no matter whether you're royal, look at Harry with Meghan, look at Scientology, Tom Cruise with Scientology, look at regular people, you know, like who get caught up in whatever cults there is. Do, are there any characteristics that you look at it and you say, these people are susceptible to these kinds of things? Yeah, and it's a very, um, it's a really controversial thing to talk about in the cult sphere, on like YouTube and everything. A lot of, there's a lot of going around, uh, there's a lot of concern about victim blaming. And, and if someone's been in a cult, there's this idea that they are a victim. And that is absolutely true. But it means that sometimes we don't talk necessarily objectively and scientifically about those people. So the one, the first thing you hear whenever you start talking to people who YouTube or whatever it might be about cults is it's never the person's fault. They were just, you know, brainwashed or, or whatever it is. And it can happen to anyone. Well, you know, I don't believe that. Um, I don't think that's true. I think all of us can be hoodwinked in some way. We can all be, uh, um, you know, we can we can fall for scams and things like that. That happens all the time, of course. But I think a particular kind of person does fall into cults, and I know it's controversial to say. I mean, firstly, even even the cult people will, will you know, they will say it's a vulnerable person or a person in a vulnerable stage of their life. So one example often given is Steve Hassan, who is seen as sort of the father of cults or knowing about cults. He's an academic, he's a very smart person, and people say, look how smart he is, look how academic he is, and yet he fell into a cult. He was in the Moonies, uh, who believe in Reverend Moon, as the second coming of Christ is a guy in South Korea. And I mean, that's just blatantly absurd. It's just completely absurd. Now, what he says is, well, what happened was I had just been dumped by my girlfriend and three beautiful women approached me in the library of the university and started telling me, hey, have you heard of Reverend Moon? Now, I just simply don't buy that most people would fall for that. I don't buy it and I, I refuse to. And I know that makes me an outlier in the cult circles. You're supposed to say, oh, yes, what a poor, how can you, you know, come on. The second coming of Christ is, is the Reverend Moon. This is clearly nuts. So something else is going on here. And I think part of it is you need to really be somebody who wants to feel special. 
and who maybe up to that point hasn't felt special. Maybe they haven't had the success in life that they wanted. So it's this real combination of vulnerability and feeling special. And you've got to be someone who likes or falls very easily into authoritarianism. So you've got to want to be in some sort of cult that has a hierarchy where you can then grow and climb and people use secrets to do this. That's why I mention it in the book, because, um, for example, Scientology, every time you climb to another rank, you're told more about Scientology. You get to learn more about the cult. Anyone who's higher up then has more knowledge and acts very superior, and they're able to feel superior over other people. Now, many of us have absolutely no urge to feel that special or to be above somebody else and somebody below us or to have somebody above us and that, all that hierarchical stuff. Many of us are libertarian in or, or, or some way towards libertarian and we just want to live our lives and let others live their lives without telling though and the reason i think it's dangerous by the way this this idea oh we were just we were just vulnerable people and it can happen to anyone is that so often i've seen people who have left cults they just go really far on another ideology often the opposite so a lot of people leave a cult like Scientology, for example, and then go really woke, like really left-wing woke and whatever. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is obviously Scientology or some of the other cults tend to be quite far right in their, you know, very authoritarian, very anti-gay often. Scientology, you can't be gay, for example. Um, all sorts <laughs> of crazy Trump things like that. <laughs> What's that? How does John Travolta or Tom Cruise pull that off? <laughs> well, I've heard that, and it's all, all bits that I get. I get from like other people who have left. But what I'm told is that the two of them don't get on very well, Tom Cruise and John Travolta, because of the allegations about John Travolta's sexuality and the things about the massage parlors and things like that. Yeah. And that Tom Cruise, uh, you know, he he's very much a true believer in Scientology. And so I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it is said that as a true believer of Scientology, Tom Cruise cannot possibly approve of John Travolta's lifestyle, if those things are even true. They're all allegations about John Travolta. So it's all a bit awkward there. But but yeah, people leave it and they go the other way and they think that's the right way. And I want to say to these people, look, you fell into a cult once. There's no shame in that. But when you come out, chill. Just take take a back seat for a moment instead of telling everybody else, ah, I was wrong before, but here's actually what's right. Because most of us didn't go into the cult we should tell them. They shouldn't be telling us. That's what I get frustrated about sometimes. Anyway, yeah. I agree with you. You know, you said something really, I, I mean, I love that that you said that. And I completely agree with you. You know that you said that there are people who are vulnerable, but at the same time, they need like, um, there's a word in Spanish. Uh, maybe you can help me. Elogio? Elogio, like... Um, um, an elegy, elegy. Like have... Yeah, like they like to be, uh, you know... Like, elegized. Like, oh, you're great. You're amazing. You're this. Eulogized, you're that. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Eul so, eulogized. Yeah, they, they they love that. You know that they're they're giving that thing. Oh, I love it. I love it. You speak Spanish. Oh, I don't have to worry. Travel with words. And then um, <laughs> so so they need that. That people are in that ways. These people are vulnerable, vulnerable, but egotistical at the same time because they need their ego stroke, right? Yeah. And at the same time, you said that they like, even though they have that ego. They, I wonder, you know, because it's something very, really interesting about that. Because at the same time, when they have their ego stroke, they don't under, they don't realize that they're actually they are being fooled, and they're actually under other person's uh, spell as long as they are as, as long as their ego is strong and they feel important and special. Something yeah. I, I don't know if I'm putting There's... in the word because we have Harry. We just an example. We just saw Megan when they took to that shameful trip when they're in that school thing and they were both on stage and there's like they're talking to each other harry's not even turning to anybody and then megan goes you see why i marry him he's so smart i mean that was something that i was like and you can see him almost inflating himself and i do believe that he's some in a form of cult like whatever. but also with tom cruise tom cruise is i i mean and this is what i want to ask you do only dumb people fall in cults because or i don't think tom cruise is dumb no, no. Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is smart uh, in certain ways. <clears throat> I, I think that is the myth that a lot of people in the cult sphere want to disabuse us of. And I think they're actually right. It's it's not just smart people. There's a great book called The Intelligence Trap by David Robson, who's a science writer, and he talks about how sometimes the smartest people are actually more prone to making big lapses in judgment. Um, so he, he gives the example of Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes. 
And he's obviously a very smart person. You know, he's the creator of the master of deduction. So he's really, really smart. But he believed in fairies. And he really, really strongly believed in it because he saw a picture somewhere that somebody had made a fake picture of fairies and he believed in fairies. This wasn't a time in the 1930s, I think. This was not a time when people normally believed in, in fairies. This was very unusual. So clever people fall for it. I think it is people who, as you point out, have want to feel special, but also they have this pursuit of status. And that is absolutely huge, first with Tom Cruise, but mainly, I mean, Harry and Meghan's a perfect example. You talk about a cult of, uh, the cult of one being in a narcissistic relationship with someone. I think a, 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 when both people might be narcissists, you also have some sort of cult thing going on. If there's, there's another great book, and I just spoke with him on my other channel, Heretics, because I've got two channels now. I mostly do royals now on that one that you've got open. And then my other channel, Heretics, I do culture wars, very serious interviews with people all in person about woke culture and the, the, the problems with woke culture and stuff like that. It's quite controversial, though. People get upset with me. But I just interviewed a guy called Will Storr, who is a hero of mine. He writes fantastic books. And he had a book called The Status Game. And basically, his belief is uh, that we all play status games. We don't realize we're doing it. And there are different ways to achieve status. Um, dominance is one of them. Um, success is another. And virtue is the third one. So, most of us try, I think a good way to do this is, is to gain status in our tribe. And by the way, anyone watching going, no, I don't do that, everyone does it. That's Will's belief anyway. We all, that, that we're humans that are trained to do that over hundreds of thousands of years. That's who we are. If you had more status, you got more food in the tribe, you got more shelter, people valued you. So the best way to do it, I think, is success. That means that you were the guy in the tribe who invented the wheel. Right, I made the wheel. Fantastic! Everybody's going to give you all the food and shelter because you you've invented stuff. You're amazing. Um, again, there are other ways. Dominance. Well, maybe you're the alpha male. You just you know bang in your chest. People are going to give you food. And if you're not dominant and you're not successful at anything, there's a third way, which I think is the sneaky route, and that is virtue. And basically, it means going around saying that you're a wonderful person. It doesn't mean you actually are a wonderful person, but if you can trick everybody in your tribe into thinking you're wonderful, that you shared your food, you helped everyone, you're going to get more food back from everyone else. And that is a last resort if you have no way to be successful or dominant. Now, Harry has been born into this hierarchical, weird situation. I love the royals, but it's a weird, unusual situation with a very clear hierarchy. I mean, they even spell it out. You know, you're first in line, you're second in line, you're third in line to the throne. That is, and, and he is right to point out that he is very much the spare and that a lot of things that were done for William, like William and Charles couldn't be on the same plane. They weren't too worried about Harry, you know, because he's just a spare. So what, what do you do if you want status when you grow up in that family. Now, how can you go about it? You can't really be dominant because William's the dominant one. Charles is dominant. Queen Elizabeth II, they were dominant. There's no way for Harry to go there. So what about success? Well, this is a guy who was just known for being unbelievably unintelligent throughout his entire education. And there's no shame in that. Not everybody can be academically intelligent, whatever. But when you're given all of the advantages that Harry has had to still be so unintelligent and unable to form coherent sentences and things like that, well, he's not going to have any success. He's not going to be able to get status that way. And that leaves him the final one, which is virtue. The only way for Harry to get some form of status is to go outside of the royal family and say, they're the bad guys in a very cultish way. And I'm off with this woman who's telling me about unconscious bias and uh, the climate and to help all the people and all this. And all, that's the only way he could get status. So I think that explains why Meghan was so attractive for Harry. Because you think that she appealed to that resentment or that need for him to be at the same level at this at, at, at the others, right? I think it's I think it's also I mean it's not just virtue it's also I mean Hollywood glamour. We've literally seen this happen before with uh, uh, what was it? Wallace Simpson wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, Edward and and Wallace was that what her name was? I've just suddenly got gone Wallace weird. Wallace Simpson yeah. Yeah, suddenly her name sounded weird. I was like that's Homer <laughs> Simpson. <laughs> no. But but yeah, of, of course, you know, if you can't I mean it was a bit different because Edward was actually in line for the throne, but he was a bit odd and different and people didn't really want him to be on the throne. He didn't want to be on the throne. It was all a bit odd. So what do you do? You go and have this glamorous 
Hollywood kind of life. And the two things are at odds now with Harry because Harry is trying to get status uh, in his virtuous sense by being with this unconscious bias kind of person, whatever, talking about all virtuous kinds of things. But at the same time, he's attracted to that kind of glitz and glamour, which is part of the whole sort of success and dominance status. And they want both. And that's been a huge problem for them. Because if they had gone off and just said, look, we don't want to be working royals anymore. We're just going to do charity work and whatever they would have had their fill of status in, in terms of virtue. Everyone would have said, well, they shouldn't have left, but they didn't write these tell-all memoirs. They weren't trying to be these big Hollywood stars. Fine, let them do it. Alternatively, they could have actually left and just said, hey, we're going to basically be the Kardashians. And I think people would have said, fine. But what we don't want is the virtue at the same time. I don't want to hear about unconscious bias. Everyone's racist in the royal family. Or I don't want to hear this stuff. If you want to be a Kardashian, be a Kardashian, but stay out of politics. They tried to do both. And that is what has pissed everyone off. They lost everyone Absolutely. because of that. And, and but, you know, back to the book and the fact that we're, we're saying that in, in the secrets, the things that you have with secrets, with books and stuff like that, these people that are able to get people to addict it to them, they're very secretive, don't you find? For example, this Miscavige guy in Scientology. I mean, I don't know what happened to his wife. I don't know what the hell's going on there. Um, why? We're talking about Harry, his need for that. But why Tom Cruise? I mean, mm. and, and John Travolta. I mean, and I got to ask you this, because from what, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what little I understand, because... Scientology is very secretive, and we're talking about cults. They're very secretive, right? Um, yeah. It's um, John Travolta. They, they you have to say everything about you. They audit you, right? And then I wonder if later on, when you try to leave, they blackmail you. Um, I mean, why? Why John Travolta and why Tom Cruise? Because well, Tom Cruise is a very smart guys switched on uh you know in many as you said in many ways what did scientology fulfill in him what what was it i mean i'm i'm, I'm one and then we're going to talk about leah remini right okay well tom cruise and john travolta are a little bit different i think uh my understanding is that john travolta's ex-wife was the one pushing this and then he had gone in so far and then it's you know it's just part of his life now we don't really know, but he's very possibly a true believer. He doesn't really attend many Scientology events now. He's It's very possible he's not really involved in it at all. Some people suggest that the death of one of his sons, his, his son, uh, was related to a lack of trying to get medicine and things like that. Um, and unfortunately, he, he died. And that, that could have been related to Scientology beliefs. Um, it, it might well be that he is being blackmailed to stay, or at least not to leave officially. Because you're absolutely right. He spent 30 years, or 20, 30 years, telling everything about his life to the auditors um, who, who just ask everything about your life. And to a point that you actually usually have to make up stuff that isn't even true. They're not satisfied until you do. So you make up stuff from past lives that you've, that, that you've done and other things you never really did. So it might be that he's sort of stuck there as long as Scientology still exists. What do you Tom mean make Cru stuff about? That they have to make stuff up. You got me on that one. What do you mean that sometimes you have to make stuff up because they're not satisfied? I'm confused about that. Sorry about oh, that. So an example is um, a guy called Alex Barnes-Ross, who's an English Scientologist, who actually worked with Bella Cruz, um, one of Tom Cruise's daughters, his daughter with Nicole Kidman, in the London Scientology office. And they used to go out um, giving out brochures in uh, Edgware Road, I think it was, in London. And it's funny, they, they targeted non-English speakers because they thought they were most likely to not fully understand what they were being given and most likely to be duped into being in Scientology. Uh, they also targeted a lot of people from sort of Arabic backgrounds um, and they had translations of Arabic texts so, uh, in Scientology because they thought they were less likely to understand or know of or have heard of the bad stuff about Scientology. So that's what Alex used to do with um, Bella Cruz. Now, firstly, Alex is a prime example of somebody who wanted status. I mean, he was he used sometimes like a bit of the lingo at school when he went. He was like 17. Uh, and it sort of made him a more interesting person in many respects. It gave him something a bit extra, some form of status. But there was a time when they locked him in a room, as they often do to people, when they did an auditing session and they wouldn't let him leave because the auditor 
had decided that Alex wasn't telling him the whole truth. And he pushed and pushed and pushed Alex. And eventually, uh, they weren't going to let him leave. So Alex had to make stuff up. And so he said, uh, they're saying, what is your ruin? That's the thing that's often asked. It's like, what is the thing that's wrong with you? And those kinds of things. But also, what can you admit to? What crimes have you committed against Scientology? This is very common in many kinds of cults and authoritarian regimes. You force people who don't even have anything they've done to reveal things. And then it's like, well, you see, you've admitted it now. So he eventually said that he stole some money from the cafeteria in Scientology. And he was crying. It was a whole thing. And eventually they let him go. So you have to make stuff up. And it's not just that. I mean, it gets really serious at higher levels. Alex wasn't a very high level. Uh, but Mike Rinder's book, he's another ex-Scientologist. And in his book, he talks about getting thrown into the hole. And the hole is a place somewhere in California, I believe, where you get put in. David Miscavige put them all in there. Apparently, David was very physically abusive with all of these people. And they were in the hole. And they were not allowed to leave for days and days and days until they admitted enough crimes that Scientology felt it was sufficient for, for, for them to, okay, you can come out now. So they have to make stuff up. So it's very possible that John Travolta has admitted things not only that are true, that he wouldn't want getting out into the world, but things that he's made up that he wouldn't want getting out. Uh, and that the same might apply to Tom Cruise, but most people I've spoken to appear to believe that Tom Cruise is a true believer. So, believer Tom, of what, though? I mean, believer of what? You know, this is um, what I don't understand. That that I mean, and I, I'm a big Star Trek fan. I'm one. Of, I am a Trekkie. I mean, you're talking to somebody who's a Trekkie. You know, I cry when Captain Kirk went uh, on the Amazon thing on Jeff Bezos thing. I was literally crying, emotional because I'm such a Trekkie. But even I, no, from what I understand, there were Titans that came and oh, yeah. they. It's a little bit like the War of the Worlds, right? Where they came and they, they is it something like that that Steven Spielberg did? That apparently the, the War of the Worlds, that these beings came years ago and they, they were like lightning, you know, and they were activating the beings that were under, under, under whatever the hell. I mean, it's such a confusing religion. What is that? Well, thing? yeah, sort of. I think, I mean, it's interesting you, you point out the War of the Worlds because, of course, that was another vehicle for Tom Cruise. And during the filming of it, of course, Tom Cruise is the main character in the film. When they were filming it, uh, it's believed that Tom Cruise sent uh, Scientologists to picket the therapy sessions of Spielberg's kids because they hate therapy. That's one of their beliefs. So there's two things that I think we have to separate with the Scientology beliefs. One is the folklore or the religion at the heart of it. Now, most Scientologists don't even know about it. This was evil galactic Lord Xenu a warlord from a different planet or galaxy sorry. who sorry. he was struggling with an overpopulation problem of billions and billions of people. And so what he did was he gathered all of these people on his own planet and he sent them to Earth, which was called Tigiak or something, I think, and threw all the billions of people into volcanoes just to get rid of them. And their souls came back as what they call body thetans, and were told lies about Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and the major religions we have today. So in that sense, Scientology is an alternative, an alternative to traditional religions. Most Scientologists don't know about this. You don't even learn about the beginnings of this until operating Thetan level three. When you get to that level, you've already spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of time, and you've excommunicated your friends from your life. You've gotten rid of... So you've gone so far. So what happens there is the boiling frog analogy where the frog is being boiled so slowly and, and also sunk cost fallacy. Uh, you've put so much into this that you have to believe it or you just don't think about it because it's so ridiculous. You just go, okay, go, 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 go. That's the religion. However... There is also a slightly more rational kind of old-fashioned cult thing going on, which is basically an alternative to therapy, and it's saying you can do anything. Anything that happens in your life is your fault. So if you get attacked in the street, it's your fault. If your friend gets attacked, it's your fault because you've done something wrong. That, even though that sounds ridiculous, is a very, very attractive philosophy to a lot of people because it gives them some feeling of control over their life. Yeah. Something bad happens to you, 
it's because you're not doing stuff right. And here are Scientology's rules about how to do things right. Maintain eye contact, uh, repeat words at, at each other for hours and hours, all these weird things. And Tom Cruise entered Scientology through his wife, Mimi Rogers, his first wife before Nicole and Katie Holmes, at a time where he wasn't that big uh, in Hollywood. And since he started adopting all of these Scientology practices, his career went through the stratosphere. So it makes sense that he would then, even if he doesn't secret, you know, secretly might not believe in Lord Zenu, but that he, it makes sense that he would believe in the practices of Scientology because it got him to where he is today. So he thinks this is working. Now, as for War of the Worlds and all of these films that he's doing, these are promotional material for Scientology. People don't realize what's really going on here because Tom has mad amounts of money. He basically runs Hollywood now, especially because cinemas are, are basically showing just like action films now. It's perfect for him. Does his own stunts. There are even movies where he dies and comes back to life again. This is very Scientology. <laughs> And people don't realize they are being fed propaganda for Scientology. That is so you look at the films, he was the like one of like twenty people involved in Mission Impossible's production at the beginning. It's now just him and his friend. Like that's it. Uh he is totally in charge of that. He is totally in charge of a huge part of the action side of Hollywood now. And it is a vehicle for Scientology. It's a little bit scary that he's that involved with the royal family, especially with Prince William and Princess Catherine, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it is a little bit because, you know, he's everywhere there. I wonder, you know, yeah, it, it's, um, I mean, he's apparently from, I don't know if he's a nice guy or not. I, I don't know how his personality is. The fact that he cut off his only daughter, like biological daughter. I mean, why would they make him do that? Yeah, there was also a, a fallout with the Beckhams, I think, because but he's Tom... back with them now because he's he went to Victoria Beckham's party. Uh, right, they're back in again. There was yeah, this big fallout because when the Beckhams arrived in Hollywood, there was a big thing because Tom sort of made uh, all these big parties for them, and it, I think it was felt that they didn't really return the favor. They didn't sign up to Scientology, all of this stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's it is look, it's a little bit worrying about their links to the royals, but I just imagine that the royals don't know too much about it. And I don't think we can blame and not that you are, but I I don't think we can blame William and, and Kate or, or Catherine because I, I think now if aliens came down to the earth and they'd never known anything about our culture, and if there was like one thing that's like what's the weirdest thing? in humanity, the single one weirdest thing. It would be that the biggest star in Hollywood for the last 30, 40 years is basically adjacent to being the leader of one of the world's most infamous and dangerous cults. And nobody cares. No one cares. It's completely crazy. So you can't blame the royals in that sense. Look, the royals have had links to some really bad people in the past, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. I don't think they maybe have done enough due diligence. They haven't really looked into some of these people in their backgrounds. But I can't expect more of the royals until people get cancelled in Hollywood at the moment for saying the wrong word. And yet this yeah. guy continues. Yeah. I mean, money talks, you know? Yeah, that is true, you know? No, I'm not saying that there's something about that, but it is worrisome because, um, mm. you know, he is, like you said, he has a lot of access. Do you think that there's any jealousy between or a rivalry between him and David Miscavige? Miscavige? I, think it's that. Um, I don't know too much about that necessarily because I think they are just so close and they both need each other. David Miscavige is, is by, by all accounts, just a really aggressive, very short, extremely short. Like I th <laughs> my, my, my understanding is he's like close to being... Topic. Well, yeah, close to being um, a little person. Because I think a little person has to be, is it something like five foot dwarf one or, or less? A dwarf or a um, midget? Well, I, I don't know. But I just, I mean, there's the, there's the height. There's like a maximum height of a little person. It's something like, I think in women it's four foot 11. And in men, I don't know if it's the same or higher. I don't know. But he's very, very short. Uh, Tom is also very, very short, but not quite as short. So you've got these guys with maybe a bit of a Napoleon complex, as you say, who were best best man at each other's weddings. There's the story of um, uh, Tom's extra um, girlfriend that he had. Um, oh, I forgot her name right now. Tom Cruise uh, girlfriend. Was it Naz It was Nazanin. Nazanin Bonyadi. Do you know about Nazanin Bonyadi? 
that's the craziest story ever. And I put it in the book, actually, in, a, in the, the, the Psychology of Secrets, because this was a big part of the whole weirdness and the secrets going on. Um, Tom, Tom apparently, Mike Rinder was there to witness this, but Tom was upset, I think, after Nicole Kidman. And he was saying, why can't I get a girlfriend? Why, why can I never get a girlfriend? Or, or whatever it was. And it's just extraordinary. This man who's extremely good looking and famous and rich and whatever couldn't get a girlfriend. It might suggest a personality flaw but I don't know. Um, and so Scientology went about getting him a girlfriend. They had this project. And this has been reported in several places now. Uh, and quite a lot of people have witnessed this. And, and people who were involved in it at the time have come out and spoken about it. So I think this is pretty, this is as close to, this is, this is what happened. And they ask loads and loads of women in Scientology about their preferences, sexual preferences, what they thought of Tom Cruise. And they eventually came down on this woman called Nazanin Bonyadi, who's a British, very beautiful actress who isn't hugely famous, but she was a Scientologist. And this was before Katie Holmes, who was not at the time a Scientologist. And part of the culture problems was trying to make Katie uh, embrace Scientology. Oh. And that, that was just never going to happen. But before Katie was Nazanin. So Nazanin wasn't told about what this was all for, all the questioning. And one day she was taken to somewhere, I believe it was in New York, I might be wrong about that, and just told, you know, go in this room, out walks Tom Cruise. And Nazanin's like, what's going on here? And she was told, you are to be Tom's girlfriend now. That's what are you doing. kidding me? No. <gasps> oh my God, they're pimps. Yeah. Oh my God. Yep. So that was her job. And the thing is, although that sounds in some respects quite horrible, because it brings up thoughts of trafficking pimping. and pimping. yeah, pimping, pimping. Absolutely. At the same time, she was, I, I believe, pretty delighted because he was the world's biggest film star and he's a, a handsome man and he's this and he's that. So she was happy at first. After like they had a month where he was getting very, very into it maybe too much, very intense. And she made two big mistakes. So firstly, she said when he won an award, he was always winning awards. At they had to keep making new awards for him. Like this what is the Tom Cruise awards, Award. But in Scientology, not in Hollywood. In Scientology. Okay. okay. So she's like uh, the, the super extra good award for Tom Cruise being a cool guy. Here's your award. Always giving him more awards. And just so he stays, because he's so important for Scientology, because he's the most famous face. He gets people, he recruits people just by virtue of being there. And so he, um, right, she said to him, oh, very well done. In Scientology, you say very well done to people who are your equals or inferiors. You don't say it to your superiors. And Tom oh. was her superior. And she said, very well done. That was a big no-no. Well, she was just being nice, probably. Yeah. Well, look, you were asking before, is Tom Cruise a nice guy? This is maybe okay, okay, the moment. Guess, for, for, okay, for anyone watching and you're wondering, I wonder if Tom Cruise... So this is the story that maybe suggests otherwise. Um, then she had dinner with him and David Miscavige and some people. And a few times she said pardon or sorry to David Miscavige. She didn't understand him. He has a very thick philly or philadelphia accent and again scientology is all about having clear communication so this was the biggest insult you could give to the leader of scientology that she couldn't understand his communication so she was out he, she didn't get told this it's just one day she came home where, wherever they, they were where's tom and she was basically told oh you're out you're not with him anymore that's it uh we're sending you back to where, wherever you were before in the Scientology. <laughs> yeah, well, one of them, yeah, one of the orgs. You're back in the org, and that's it. And she then told somebody else, like a friend of hers, uh, what, what had happened. <laughs> and that friend was a good Scientologist. And if you're a good Scientologist, you report that your friend told you something. So the friend reported her for telling a secret she shouldn't have. What a snitch. Yeah which led to Nazanin cleaning bathrooms with a toothbrush. That was her punishment and running around and all sorts of weird punishments for her. And that was how Nazanin ended up. And that was Tom Cruise's weird relationship with her. That is the weirdest thing ever. And, you know, I want to ask you something. That we're talking about cult leaders in a way. 
that they're extremely narcissist and, and they don't even have to be very smart, right? They just have to know which buttons to push because Meghan Markle is not very smart. Jada Pinkett Smith, I believe she's evil. I also don't think she's very smart because what's the deal? Are they Scientologists? Because what happened with Jada? I mean, how can she have Will Smith? And this is the thing, though, I got to tell you. These women are less than average. Or these people, like David Miscavige. I mean, I don't think that guy, you know, is that great. As you say, he's probably a midget. But he got this power, right? Mm. And, and then you have somebody like Jada Pinkett Smith. And then you have somebody like Mega Markle. If you look at Jada Pinkett Smith and Mega Markle, they're both D-list people. They're, they're not that, there's nothing really special about them other than the fact that they think highly of themselves. And then they study their praise because, you know, I mean, I just saw that. You know, I got to tell you, when I saw Mega Markle tell Harry, I he's so smart and he's almost like floating on stage when she said that. You can see him almost... I know it's a weird thing, you know, it's like he, he grew, like he, 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 he himself, I can see it in his face, you know, mm. he felt so pleased and it's like, I'm the man, I'm the big man. At the same time, while she's having complete control. And I see that on Will Smith with Jada, you know, because for mm. example, when she was recording him and he's like, Jada, you know, uh, stop recording me. This is my bread and butter. And like, I mean, getting him on that red table and saying, talking about entanglement and then having him smack. Chris Rock. I mean, what are the David Miscavige that has, as you said, the biggest star in the world, which is Tom Cruise right now, who's running Hollywood. It's at his beck and call pretty much. But at the same time, they praise them while holding them captive. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think it's like there's there's an age old debate here. And it's a debate I have with friends. I'm sure many people have had when somebody has been extremely successful. So let's say Donald Trump. And, and you could even argue that he wasn't actually successful. He just inherited money or I don't know what. And then, but he was successful with the presidency and he'll probably win again. Uh, does that necessarily mean that this is a smart person? And you, it doesn't have to be Trump. You can apply it to someone else. But that's a debate I've had with friends of mine. Some A friend of mine was saying, well, look how well he's done. He's obviously really smart. And then the other side of that is, well, is it just that this is a person willing to do things that most of us would not be comfortable doing? Do, are, are they devoid of that very particular empathy about that specific thing? It doesn't mean they're necessarily psychopaths. It doesn't mean Megan is necessarily a psychopath. But she was somebody who had a very, very specific goal. I mean, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a YouTuber. You're a YouTuber. We have many more subscribers than most people do. Does it mean we're more intelligent? I don't think it does. I think it just means that we really had a goal in mind and we did everything we could to get there. Fortunately, I don't know about you, but I imagine it's the same. We didn't have to like run over other people to do it. We didn't no, have to, no, 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 no. you know, but there are some people and I'm sure everybody listening and watching has got some of those people in their lives, whatever their job is or their friends, they will know people or they will be those people themselves who will just do anything to get to the top. I do just want to point out, by the way, that by virtue of being a little person, that, that doesn't make you a bad person. Just that, David. That <laughs> no, no, no. We just, no. Of course lots of not. wonderful, <laughs> there are wonderful short people, wonderful little people. It, it's just that, um, it's just that there, with, with Miss Cabbage in particular, it might be some sort of Napoleon, a Napoleon complex and things. Oh like no, that. no, no! I have a lot of friends that are short and they're great. They're funny. They even make fun of themselves. You know, they're and I mean, yeah. I, 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 you know, like you got to make fun of yourself, don't you? You got to laugh. People, you know, this is this is sad that we're in this era that we have to clarify things because you know, people who are smart they will know that we're not demeaning all people who are short. You know, it's just we're talking specifically about one individual. You know, mm. and well, well, that's it. I, I agree with you, and I, I think actually that that environment we're in. People are like people are so careful about very specific types of identity, but they won't be about others. And so, uh, little people, for example, I think that's the right word to use these days. Would be like, hey, wh why am I the only one that people don't have to be careful about? So I actually agree with you. Like, we need to be able to joke and laugh. And I wish that people would stop being so sensitive about every other identity and then leaving other ones out. Because if you're going to be that sensitive, you have to do it about everyone. And I would rather we just all. Just relaxed a bit. Chill out. And remember, Go back to where, yeah. where things used to be before, you know? You have no idea mm. how I joke with my buddies here, you know, in Canada and everything, you know? Uh, you have no idea because otherwise people, the people nowadays, people at my age bracket, we are from the 80s. We were born in the 60s, you know? Mm. 
you know, you fall wow. down, you walk it off. You don't go to the therapist. You know, you break your, oh. remember this located my knee when I fell off the horse and my grandpa goes, just walk it off, Pat. My middle name is Patricia. Walk it off, Patty, walk it off. And I'm like, <laughs> and somebody came and they just put, they just pulled my knee back on. And I, I think I passed out and then they, you know, put a band around it. And he says, you're good to go. Just make sure you don't jump on it. But, you mm. know, nowadays I believe that therapy is overdone too, you know, and I'm not being mm. a Scientologist, but oh I find God. that people, 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 you know, it's like not everything has to be a tragedy. I've gone through a lot of stuff in my life. And to tell you the truth, I only sought therapy for my son, how to deal with my son in the sense that my son was very traumatized or very introvert and things that were affecting him a lot deeper than I thought, you know, and he was very small. So I wanted some guidance because I really felt at a loss how to handle those situations in regards yeah. to my son, because I am from the age that we deal with things, you know, we just like Prince Philip, you deal with it, you know, you deal with it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So now, therapy was good for you. was good for you then. I, I it's, you know what? I think, I think that's the issue. That, that is the issue with, with Scientology, by the way, because I think you're, you're right. Like, there are some points to be made about that. And there's that famous Tom Cruise video now where he was arguing because he doesn't like therapy. Um, what was this? Matt someone. I can't remember his name now. Um, but, but Matt Tom Lauer. Cruise, Matt Lauer. And he's having this crazy, crazy argument. Meghan Markle ex-boyfriend. <laughs> oh, right. Well, really? He is? Well, she was in the Today Show and they, they were spent hours in his dressing room. Mm, that's interesting. Well, Matt Lau is not somebody in whose dressing room you want to be stuck from what I've heard, according to the allegations. But allegations. Tom <laughs> Tom comes across, I think, as a complete lunatic and very aggressive. But increasingly, that video is being viewed a bit differently because people are starting to say, well, he has some points about over-prescribing medications and over-reliance on therapy. And Scientology couldn't work if it was just completely stupid. Now, the Lord Zeno stuff is completely stupid, but the stuff about like, hey, you can own this, you've got this, there's some good stuff in that that some people get addicted to. They love that. Um, so I think you're right. And I think the reality is, you know, we can't rely on things like therapy. We can't put everything into them, but they are often for good for certain people. They, they're useful. And therapy has been quite useful for me as well. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm, please understand. I'm, 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 and I'm not, not endorsing therapy if you need it for sure. But you know, now kids, I see. I kid you not. One of my, my best friends, my best friend's mom, uh, she's a psychologist, very well known psychologist. She gives um, lectures all over Latin America, Central, and you know, and she had a kid come to her office. She didn't give us the name, of course, um, because his mother took away his cell phone and he felt traumatized. And this is like a 12 year old kid because he felt that his mother was being abusive by taking away his phone because he wasn't doing his chores. He was doing very poorly in school. And I mean, yeah. it's gotten to that point, you know, that it's, I mean, therapy is great for people who really need it. You know, you, 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 at some point in your life, you need guidance, but I always find that everything is with balance. If you take it, like you said, they take it too far that's that's terrible and i want to ask you something about this types of personalities when you said that um uh for example that they go too far once they feel that they've gone too far it's like there's no way back they might they're gonna ride that wave until they completely crash is that it i think so um <sighs> I'm saying for Harry, what? because Harry has cut all his, I mean, right. you said it right, because he's really in a cult-like situation, isolated from his family and friends. And he's doing the same to his children, if he, if they have any. They're, he's doing the same thing to his own children, you know. Um, he's isolated from back. everybody. He's trashed everybody around. He's become a clown to the world. And even to Megan. You know, uh, and I don't think Megan really respects him because I think this is the kind of woman who respects a man's man, you know, um, mm. but um, he's really gone too far. He's really gone too yeah. far. Do you think he feels that since he ha there's no way back for him that he's going to ride or die with that woman? It's probably an unconscious thing. Um, I looked at some research recently showing that although we feel like our beliefs are formed in the pursuit of truth or accuracy, so we feel like, I believe this because I think it's true, the opposite is actually true. Our beliefs form 
because of the people around us and because of the cults or tribes that we want to fit into. I, I firmly believe, and some people disagree with this, and I understand that as well, that there's a book called Cultish by Amanda Montell, Cult-ish. And the implication here is that every kind of cult is on a spectrum. So Scientology or Heaven's Gate or Jonestown, they might be a 10 out of 10. But your local library or book club, that might be a 2 out of 10. You know, and it starts to rise up if you feel like there are certain comments and feelings and things that you can't say to the rest of your people in your book club. Like, oh, I, I wish I could say this, but I can't. And if I leave, these are my only friends now. I'm, I can't leave the book club. Well, that's starting to feel a bit cultish. And I think where that gets really complicated is in relationships because you're tied up to that person both emotionally and physically. So Harry's very tied up in and with Megan. So his beliefs, he's not going to be, his brain, just like the rest of us, is not going to be going, what's the truth here about the racism of the royal family? And how, are, are they actually so bad? You know, he's not going to be thinking that because he's in his own version of Scientology, which is the cult of one. It's it's Meghan Markle. And so his beliefs are going to be framed around around her. So he's not sitting there thinking, oh God, I've gone too far. I have to just keep going. It's just happening naturally in him. He's just getting more and more entrenched in his view. And he's gone so far now that to even entertain the idea that he might be wrong would be incredibly painful to him. And he's not going to let that thought in. He hasn't done so far. He's extremely stubborn. And because imagine what it would take. I mean, okay, the Scientologists, they have to go, I've spent my life savings. I've completely excommunicated all all of my friends and family, maybe that led to one of them getting depression and something bad happened to them. I've recruited a hundred more people into this mess. So if I'm going to admit to myself that this is a cult and it's evil, that's going to hurt. And that's something that they don't want to have that thought. Well, Harry, <laughs> he's burned every bridge. He has said the most awful things. He's made himself look incredibly stupid on TV. And the only nice thought that he can have is, well, I'm right about this and I've got some people who believe me and agree with me and I'm just going to keep going. So I can't see him. Do you him. think that's why he keeps his circle small and his circle gets, keeps getting small? Do you think that at some point, though, there must be something, as you said, he doesn't want to entertain the idea, but there's got to be, look at Leah Remini uh, when she left Scientology. I mean, I, we have, and she grew up in that, right? Because her parents are the ones who brought her into that, right? So she was very young. Mm. I mean, how did she so, get up? How did she break that mold? I've seen other people. So, Look at Johnny Depp with Amber Turd. Yeah, well, well, this is he's a good example, actually, because people, again, this is something that people, I think, don't realize is that uh, people don't leave a cult because, like, they wake up one day and go, like, oh, my God, what have I been doing? You know, they don't wake up and go, God, Lord Zenu, that sounds crazy. Or, oh, my gosh, Megan's this or that. Again, this is because of the way we form beliefs. So those beliefs just will not enter a radicalized person's mind. They leave a cult because there's no alternative. It's it's so bad in the cult that they have to leave. Every Scientologist I spoke to who left said it got so bad. They were being tortured. They were being made to not eat. They were not sleeping. They were just being shouted at and punched in the face every day that they had to leave. And even then, their beliefs remained. So they left Scientology and they still believed things. And there's a great conversation I had with um, uh, Matt Head. Oh, I forgot his, again, even his, um, hang on. <laughs> How have I forgotten everyone's names? This is crazy. Uh, Headley Scientology just gonna I can't believe that uh, hang on Headley Mark I was gonna say Matt that's crazy and I've interviewed him so many times Mark Headley and I've written him about him he's in the book as well I wrote this story but Mark um, left it got so bad he had to leave him and his wife left as well uh, Claire and they then watched the South Park episode about Scientology which reveals the truth oh yeah <laughs> but but Mark wasn't yet at the level where you're supposed to know this stuff. So you're told in Scientology, if you hear this too early, you get pneumonia and you die. Okay. So he got out. He watched the South Park. He learned all the truth. He was saying to his wife, who was higher up, she already knew. So he was saying to her, like, is this true? And she was like, yeah, this is what they believe is what we are supposed to believe. And he woke up the next morning all nervous, like, oh, my God, am I alive? I'm alive. And only then did the beliefs start to change. 
What I'm saying is Harry's not going to leave the cult of Meghan as long as it keeps giving him good things. Now, good things are going on these nice holidays to Nigeria, getting given loads of presents by everybody, getting hundreds of millions of dollars from Netflix and Spotify and all of these kinds of things. Um, he just shuts out the noise of people like us and he listens to the people who love him. There are enough people who still love him, even if it's a small percentage. That's still thousands of people. And he just listens to that. It would have to get really, really bad with Megan. Megan would have to start bullying him, start telling him how awful he is. Life would have to become unbearable for him to leave. And even then, actually, actually Andrew, yeah. I have, I am, I am, I have an interview that I did with um with a former maid, and I'm doing another one on the 19th, which is actually Harry and Meghan's uh um, what's it called, uh, anniversary, sixth wedding oh. anniversary, and she said that the few times she's seen them in the mansion, uh, Meghan is actually very nasty towards Harry. You know, uh, yeah, I'm so not surprised. I'm not surprised. Well, you know, it, it's it's something, and I wonder if she's managed to demean his self esteem, or this is why That's I said to him, he feels he has nowhere else to go, so he has to ride it with this woman. But it's I mean, I mean to wrap it up because you're giving me almost an hour, sweetie. I mean, in in your book, in your book, uh, what is basically you think that all the people who are cult leaders are secretive? Do, would you say that they're all smart? I mean, it, we go across the board. I mean, we went from we went from David Miscavige to Rachel Meghan Markle to um, you know I don't know somebody else, some other cults. I mean, this Richard Man, what was it? Oh, the Bramson? No, Richard. Bra what's the Bramson? No, Manson. Well, Richard Branson's not not a cult leader. Oh, Manson. Are you think Manson? Richard yeah, Branson Manson. nearly joined Nixium, or at least he spoke he spoke at something about Nixium, which is another cult. Oh, but, that's uh, another. Manson yeah, Nixium was a bit like a Scientology light cult. And uh, they went to, and I write about them as well in the book. They go to, they ended up in prison and it didn't last as long as Scientology. But again, it's all about secrets. Um, the women would, this was a horrible, horrible man in, in charge. Um, and um, um, he would, he mostly he got women, a guy called Keith Ranieri. And he would say to these women, I will give you status. You know, you, you're no longer just a Californian rich housewife. You're somebody in this really cool movement where we learn stuff like Scientology does. You know, we learn to take control of our lives. And it's a very appealing kind of cult. And when the, because it was mostly women, uh, attractive young women, they would get an offer eventually. Hey, do you want to join the higher level, the secret higher level? And it was called DOS, D-O-S. And they were like, well, of course, I want more status. And to join, you have to give something called Collateral, which is another Tom Cruise film, um, oh. coincidentally enough. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to give Collateral, which basically means you have to tell the people at Nixium before you go to DOS secrets about you. And they're going to use them against you, a lot like auditing and Scientology. So they had to give stuff. And if they didn't have anything, they had to make it up. Often, if it wasn't about them, it was about their husbands. And they had to make stuff up that could ruin their lives. It had to be really, really dangerous because they needed to know that once you got into DOS, you were never going to speak about it. Because if you did, Nixium would tell everybody your secrets. Mm -hmm. And so they get into DOS and it emerged. DOS was just basically a uh, place for women to be coerced into having sex with uh, Keith Ranieri. Good. And if they, if they said no, all their secrets would be out in the world. So not only that, they were then tattooed, not tattooed, branded with like a branding iron that you do to cows. Uh, like with the Yeah, like what? Oh, yes. I haven't seen it, but I know. I know. Um, well, they were branded with the initials. They were told it was a secret symbol but it was actually the initials of Keith Ranieri um, and Alison Mack, who was the other person sort of in charge of this, who was an actress from Smallville. So is Keith smart? I don't know. He seemed, I mean, somebody I, I know who met him, Vanessa Gregoriadis, she interviewed him in person and was just utterly unimpressed by this man. So I think what happens really, it just needs to be somebody who is willing to put in the hours for learning about neuro-linguistic programming, how to sort of hypnotize people with your words, um, and looking at how Scientology worked, looking at other cults, and just applying that with no morals whatsoever, and there's your cult. It, it is very interesting because, just to wrap it up, the thing with, right, like, Megan, you know how everything is a secret about her, like the children are secret. It's, it's like in the royal family, it's like, and she gets people to be 
a complicit in her secrets. And this is how she exerts control. Like, because as you said, if Harry wants to leave, I'm pretty sure she has the goods on him. Oh, yeah. Imagine that. Imagine a book on Harry from uh, Megan would write. And the thing is, you just said something very interesting, how sometimes they have to make things up to please people. I wonder if in the book Spare, this is why he made some things up. Because, you know, I don't know. I mean, because we know that there's so many lies. But it's very interesting because uh, please buy the book, sign, sign, subscribe to her Heretics and Andrew Gold, of course, his other channel, which I will be leaving the link. But it's fascinating. And, and, and you know, like, how long did it take you to write this book, Andrew? Oh, two or three years, really. Ooh. What was fun was like, yeah, I got this. Uh, so this was published by Pan Macmillan and they commissioned it or took it or whatever the word is before my YouTube channel had really any subscribers. Nobody knew who I was. And that's a really nice feeling because it meant like, OK, I the knew. book is good. You might have what from right at the beginning? Yeah, I watched. You. Well, even when I had I like only... I loved your voice. I told you I loved your voice. I, <laughs> you know, one of these days, you I, I, this is way back, like two two years ago or something like that. I was just you know, and I and you popped up and I go, oh, he looks interesting, and I started listening to you, and I'm like, oh, I love. I told you we were. I told you Aww. I loved your voice. Yeah. Paula, thank you so much. Yeah, well, I'm um, now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. Um, oh yeah, so it, just, it was a good feeling because it was like oh, it's not just because I have some status or whatever it is. It's like you actually like the idea enough to publish a book, which anyone will tell you, like, they, it's not no easy thing. So it took, it was years of forming the book, the idea, and then pushing it to different publishers and things, getting an agent, all these things. And then the book itself, yeah, two or three years, I went around to different countries. There's one particularly scary incident in a village in North Germany that was like, mad that's chapter nine the worst secret in the world that i hope people get to find out about yes, yes, yes. don't say it don't say it here yeah it's insane so so yeah it was a lot of work a lot of time i don't know how quickly i'll be able to do another one because it's like oh gosh i need it's a lot of that work was a right? lot yeah but i love it i love that thing i love that book and, it makes and me just happy. before you leave you said that we know that the cult people we see what scientology does to people who leave how they destroy them and i am sure that people when you were doing your scientology videos and interviews that people came after you right and mm -hmm. i find i wonder and now that you're doing mega markle things people are also coming after you which one of the two cult members do you find more hateful towards you that you have, have more more trouble dealing with there's actually another cult that gives me the most problems and I don't want to, don't want to even mention them because every time I do, I get lawyers and everybody emailing me from the cult. So I just leave it. But that cult just will not leave me alone. Uh, the Megan stuff gives me trouble now. I never had too much trouble with Scientology. There were occasionally mm -hmm. people who might have been in OSA, which is the Office of Special Affairs. They're the ones who tried to sort of infiltrate South Park to stop them doing the episode and stuff like that. And so... <laughs> I've had I, like horrible tweets and things like that. A lot of the stuff I get really is from the other channel, Heretics. And I, it's a lot of stuff that's sort of anti-woke culture. And that is, you know, and it, it's because I believe them it's not very moral. I don't think that woke is, is moral. I think it's cult-like and ideological. Yeah, I agree. But that is, well, good. And a lot of people won't. And that's difficult. And I, I try to say to them, like, I know I understand that youth, because they say, oh, but all these vulnerable people you're hurting. And I say, no, you're making it worse for them by doing this stuff, unfortunately. And, and I might be wrong, but that's my belief. And no, you know, no, no. I agree with you. And I mean, it's not because mm. you're wrong or right, but it's just that as an older lady, I, I've lived a lot and I've been through many countries yeah. and, and the things that I'm seeing now absolutely baffle me you know people say, oh, your channel should be bigger and stuff like that, because every time I talk about something that, you know, or you, or you or want something for debate or get a different point of view. Oh, you're a hater. You're this. It's it's, it's such a polarized society yeah, yeah. that grifter. we live in right now. They say hmm? you're a grifter. They say okay. like, oh, you're such a grifter. <laughs> that that one, you're just trying to grift. That's why you did the culture war stuff. And the culture war stuff doesn't make any money compared to the stuff I did about Scientology and cults. It's just I think it's important. And people are welcome to disagree, but those are the, often those are the ones that like really give me a hard time. I've not been able to promote the video, like, the, the book, sorry, because uh, every festival where I was supposed to attend and speak has disinvited me because I said I don't believe that trans women are literally women. And are you that's, serious? Yeah, that's what that's the that's the situation where we're, we're well, at now. If you're born with a dick, you're not a chick. I've said it. Okay, so <laughs> see, and I never say it like that, but I, but you know, I, 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 I think that's woman, true. I'm a woman, and I am offended. I am, you know, one of my hairstylists in in London actually. Um, 
she's a trans, uh, she's about 70 years old and I admire her so much because mm. she, she knew she was, she, she didn't feel right. And she took matters into her own hands when it wasn't popular. I mean, we're talking, I mean, she's at 71 and we're talking that she did it at 17 because they wouldn't do it in England. She went to Greece to get it, to get it done. But even she would tell me, I am not, I don't consider myself a female. I am trans. And whenever she goes into a relationship or because she looks beautiful, she, I mean, yeah. Um, and then she, and I said, well, you know, when, how, what do you do when you meet a guy? And, and you know, and she goes, well, I tell him. I tell him, you know, this is, I'm not a, I mean, I was born a male. I am transgender. I'm not a female. I'm transgender, you know, and I'm, and, and I have a lot of gay friends, my hairstylists and they, and they get really angry when people, you know, it's like, and I, I do, I do, I do live to this, with this, um, Matt, Matt the angry bootnik because he's not woke at all. I mean, his channel gets penalized all the time. You know, it gets strikes right, left and center. And, and yeah, I mean, you're right. And I'm so sorry that's happening to you. So they disinvited you because you basically stated the biological truth, fact. Yeah, yeah, you can't now. But this is, you know, I like to think it's still a small percentage of people who are very loud and vocal, as they will be some of them in the comments on your on this video, because that always happens. There's always some. But it's a small group of people who really often have what we call luxury beliefs. They're people who have the luxury of being able to really go for this. So it's a lot of people in certain areas where, for example, uh, a man going into a woman's toilet isn't perceived by them as such a problem or in women, you know, they, they're not in women's prisons. So why do they care? So these are beliefs that are they don't have a child who is trying to get a scholarship from sports and is being out of the team because somebody who went through male puberty, you know? So these are luxury beliefs, and you get luxury beliefs in book publishing, podcasting, um, um, academia, book festivals. This is where you get all of those people who are very much in a bit of a cult and don't really speak to anybody outside of it. So they think that their view is the one, not just the moral one, they think it's the one that everyone has, even though... The country, like in the UK, has voted conservative time and time again. Like they don't share those views. But it's, no matter how much you say these things to these people in these elite um, little bubbles, they won't change their minds because beliefs don't change until you're kicked out. That is the cult thing we were talking about before. So they would have to be treated so badly by their friends that they would leave and then the views change. And I've seen that happen recently um, because... The one place that this is getting a bit divisive in sort of the woke elite circles is Israel-Palestine because of a lot of Jewish people. Now, I know a lot of, I'm Jewish myself, and I know a lot of Jews who are in the woke circles, you know, because you get Jews who are conservatives, left wing, you know, everything. And I know loads of them who are in the woke circles who are, are hearing different information from what their cult tells them because they go home and their families give them a different side of the view of view, their friends outside and all of that. And they're very protective of Israel. So they're hearing very different things to what their woke friends are hearing. And it's an, an example where they they feel like they're treated so badly in that group, the, the cult, whether it's Scientology, Meghan Markle or your woke group, that they move outside. And now you have Jews who are all voting conservative or gradually moving away from the other woke views because of what's happened with Israel Palestine. So it's really interesting to see that happen. We don't believe things because they're true. We believe them because our peers believe them. Your only truth. when they treat us. Your yeah. truth. It's like, you know yeah, what? I'm I'm shocked. And this is we're gonna wrap up. I don't want to take your time. I know you're no. busy. Um um the gaslighting that the mainstream media is doing right now with Rachel Meghan Markle claiming to be 43% Nigerian yeah. and the people are endorsing it as a fact. I know. I mean, I know. this is just, I mean, this is, are we, have we lost our minds? You know, have we lost our minds? I kid you not. Have we lost our minds and, and smart people? I see people from the, you know what? Now that you mentioned that they cancel your thing, I'm going to promote your book and pretty much every platform. I'm going to ask everybody to promote it and stuff because oh, thank it you. really pisses me off that that is not right because you are entitled to your beliefs and you're not being hateful about it. It is a biological oh. fact. If you're born with a dick, you're not a chick. You know, you get thank operated, you, yeah. you cut it off. You know, there's, I'm, we're going to yeah. do it. Like this, this, uh, there's a, I watch over and over something called El Patrón del Mal. Yo no sé si lo ha visto. Que Pablo Escobar, mm. it's, a, it's a, El Patrón del Mal. It's um, the father the of evil. evil. It's Pablo Escobar. And then he's doing, uh, in, in the series, he goes, uh, because he's sending his soldiers, his 
his killers to kill people. And then he goes, you know what? I, I, I may think I'm a mother and I, you know, I, and I think that I, you know, I, I may have all the maternal instincts, but this breasts are not going to breastfeed anybody because I'm a man, you know, so I, no matter if I feel like a mom. So, but it's funny how they say it in Spanish. You know, so I was laughing my head off because it, it is so true, but, but thank it you is. so very much, Andrew. And I am going to promote your book. I am very sorry that that cult is attacking you because it's affecting your earning potential, your hard work. And oh, that's thanks, insane yeah. because we should be able to to have our opinions, which are backed by facts. But that's oh, just- Thank you, yeah. I just want my book in like in people's homes. It's such a beautiful purple thing. I want it out yeah. there. So look, you know, you're helping and people, YouTube, YouTubers will help. I'm doing an interview in, in a minute with someone else as well. And it, it, this that's the way to do it. I just can't go to book festivals, which is a bit sad. Are you like, I am so sorry about that. So please guys, I am going to be promoting this. I'm going to leave his links and I'm going to leave his links everywhere. I'm going to be putting it on X and I'm going to ask other YouTubers to post it as well. Um, because I, I believe that YouTube has become now the tool where we come to hear certain news that are true. So thank you very much for your time, Andrew. Thanks you so much. Oh, que lindo. And thanks. Thank you. thank you very much, sweetie. And have a great day. <laughs> Gracias. Yeah, <was. laughs>